I'm supposed to talk about the history of the tree. And if that's the case, it'll be really short because there's really not much to say about the tree. It's, it's white ash and it's 111 years old. It was uh, planted at a ceremony in 1895 that, believe me, is much smaller than what we're doing today. This is a much larger deal than it was back then. Really, the, the interesting question, and what I'm going to talk about, is why was the former president of the United States in Richmond, Indiana, for an extended period of time? And the answer to that, he was, he was being a lawyer. Now, Benjamin Harrison pretty much was a lawyer all of his life. It was his first love. He was also a Civil War general, but prior to the war, he was a lawyer. As soon as the war was over, he went back to being a lawyer. He was a senator, and then in 1888, he became president. He was actually he was the president that served between Grover Cleveland's two non-consecutive <coughs> terms. And then in uh, 1892, when he lost the election to Grover Cleveland, he went back to being a lawyer. Some of the uh, more famous cases that he did actually after this one was a very lengthy case in which he represented the government of Venezuela in a border dispute with Great Britain. So that was quite the uh, issue at the time. But when he was here in Richmond, he was trying the celebrated Morrison Will case. Now, yes, I work at Morrison Reeves Library, and there is a connection. And bear with me, I promise it will be short because it's complicated. Um, okay, James Morrison was the son of the library's founder. He died in 1893. His daughter was still alive. His son was not. The son's children, so his grandchildren, lived in Chicago and they felt that they had not been adequately represented in the will. And so they hired a high-powered lawyer, i.e. Benjamin Harrison, from Indianapolis, to represent them in this case. They brought suit. The, uh, it was, as I say, high-powered. Not only was Benjamin Harrison, he was the lead lawyer for the plaintiffs, they also had, it was another attorney from Indianapolis, but then also the local lawyers included uh, Richard Jackson, Henry Starr, Charles Bershenal, and John Roop, all of which were, who at the time, were very prominent citizens. Uh, John Roop was the mayor at one point. Now, the lawyers for the defense were equally notable, starting with Henry Underwood Johnson, who at the time was a U.S. congressman from this district. Also was uh, Judge John F. Kibbe, uh, Wayne County, I believe, circuit judge. Uh, judge Henry Fox, who most people might remember as the editor of the 1912 County History. And also Thomas Studi and John Robbins. So you've got a real high-powered team of lawyers on both sides. So this really was a huge, huge case. The thing was... I basically kind of liken it to the O.J. Simpson case uh, in, on a smaller scale. The newspapers covered the, the details, and I mean details. I mean sometimes verbatim testimony daily. Most days people were turned away from the courthouse because they, they wanted to be spectators and there just wasn't enough room for them. The trial itself really was not terribly exciting because the... Um, the plaintiffs, the grandchildren, were claiming that James Morrison was of unsound mind and was unduly influenced when he made his last will. And so to prove that, they pretty much had a whole slew of people, and, and the questions ran something like, well, the last time you saw him, was he like himself? So, you know, it was, and I've not gone through it, believe me, at all. But what I've scanned is, is really pretty dry. The thing was, this trial went on for four solid months. At the time, it was the longest court, the longest jury trial in American history to that time. But it was definitely high entertainment for Richmond citizens. Um, as I said, people followed it daily in the paper. And I'm sure part of it was just to see the ex-president, and I'm sure part of it was just the spectacle of seeing all these, these members of the upper, upper crust picking away at each other. So, along about the end of April, 
I think that the park commissioners probably wanted to do something with the president, and they sort of noticed that the, the trial was kind of winding down. They were running out of, of witnesses. And so they asked the president, the ex-president, to come out to Glen Miller Park, which at that point, a lot of times they just called it the Glen, to plant the tree. And the park commissioners at the time, and if I could, just let me point out who these guys are. Um, I didn't use my handy pointer. Official, you know, original material. Um, this guy right here is, is Frank Reeves. This is E.G. Hill, as in the Hill Roses. And this one right here behind the president, this is the president, the rather large man with the shovel. That is president, ex-president Harrison. The man right behind him is Cornelius Ratliff. And so those three were the park commissioners at the time. Now this, uh, this man here is Judge Kibbe. He also came that day, which I'm not really sure exactly why, because he was on the opposite side. I don't know if it was a matter of wanting to have both sides represented or if he was just an old friend of the president. That's a possibility, too. So they all came out to the park. It was, a, you know, April afternoon. It was kind of chilly. Everybody looks like they're kind of bundled up. But there really weren't that many more people than what you see in the picture. And really the reason that we, I think a big part of why we still remember this today is because one of the people there was Edwin Dalby with his camera. And he took this picture and published it then in his two famous books in 1896 and 1906. And so they've been recycled many, many, many times. So the party arrived. The hole was already dug. The tree was sitting there waiting to be placed in the hole. And he asked that uh, Judge Kibbe actually hold the tree, and he started. The, the president started shoveling the dirt in. They were making jokes back and forth a little bit. The uh, president accused Judge Kibbe of not holding it straight, and that he wouldn't be responsible if it grew up crooked. But I don't really think that's much of a problem. Uh, when he had all the uh, the hole, uh, the dirt back into the hole, Mr. Hill presented him with a bunch of carnations, which is that actually Judge Kibbe is holding them right now in, in the picture there. And I really, I don't know why they would be carnations and not roses, but that's what the paper said, carnations. He was asked to say some words. He declined, said, no, Judge Kibbe can speak if he wants to. They all got back into the carriage and went back to town. That was it. So, but as we see, the tree is still here. It has flourished. <laughs> may need a little trimming right now, but they all went back to, to town. They resumed the trial. The actual trial ended with the jury finding for the plaintiffs, therefore meaning that the, uh, the James Morrison was of unsound mind, and therefore uh, what, what the grandchildren wanted was for the court to divvy up the, the fortune. But the defendants then said... Well, if he was of unsound mind to create a new will, then he was of unsound mind to break the old will. So they claimed that the old will was still in effect, which really didn't help the grandchildren too much. So basically they had to start all over again. And finally somebody came to their senses, and they all sat down at a table and hashed it out among themselves, and that was it. And everybody went back along their ways, and, and Benjamin Harrison went back to Indianapolis and resumed the rest of his law career. And that's pretty much the story of the surrounding of the tree. So.